This event is in line with the priorities of the Government of Canada and Toronto Centre. Nous sommes ravis d'être de retour ici à Ottawa. C'est la deuxième fois que nous faisons une présentation ici et la première fois que nous participons à la Semaine internationale du développement. We're so excited to be back in Ottawa. This is our second time hosting an event here, our first time participating in International Development Week. Avant de commencer, j'aimerais souligner et mentionner que nous nous trouvons sur le territoire traditionnel et non cédé du peuple Before we get started, I want to acknowledge that we're standing on unceded Algonquin territory. Et je veux aussi vous mentionner que cette rencontre est enregistrée et diffusée en direct. This event is being recorded and live streamed. Un mot sur le format de cette rencontre. Il y aura trois discussions qui seront chacune suivies d'une période de questions, donc trois périodes de questions. Il n'y aura pas de long discours, mais il y aura de nombreuses occasions de poser des questions. Nous avons un animateur chevronné et nous serons heureux de répondre à vos questions. There will be three sessions, each followed with a round of Q&A, so three question periods altogether. There are no long speeches today, but ample opportunity for audience participation. We have a very capable senior moderator, and we welcome your questions. J'aimerais maintenant vous présenter M. Babak Abbasade, président et directeur général du Toronto Centre depuis 2010. Sous sa direction, l'organisation a connu une transformation importante. Alors qu'elle offrait seulement 19 programmes quand elle a commencé, elle en offre aujourd'hui 80, partout dans le monde et pour tous les secteurs des services financiers. At this stage, I would now like to introduce Babak Abbasade, President and CEO of Toronto Centre. Wow, nice crowd. Uh, merci, Denis. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Bienvenue. Nous sommes ravis de participer à la 30e semaine du développement international. Je suis heureux de voir autant de visages familiers ici présents. Uh, I also like to acknowledge at this point a few special people who are here with us today, members of our board of directors, uh, Jeremy Rudden, Maureen Jensen, our vice chair, Ilana uh, Singer, who's the chair of our Securities Advisory Board. And also like to acknowledge the Toronto Center team who worked so hard to get this done. Without them, I wouldn't be standing here. This panel wouldn't be here. So thank you. Toronto Center's mission is to build the capacity of financial supervisors. Think of financial supervisors and central bankers like health or safety professionals. Their work is invisible until something goes wrong, such as the failing of one isolated bank or the systemic collapse of the entire financial system. Why would this be an international development concern? Because financial collapse or anemic growth disproportionately devastates the most vulnerable segments of society in developing countries, which include women and children. Les superviseurs doivent constamment être conscients de risques émergents. Keeping an eye on the emerging risks is always very important. As highlighted by Governor Mark Carney, choose the country in which he's a governor, huh? climate risk is the most pressing issue facing the global financial system. Climate action is SDG 13. Toronto Center is working with supervisory authorities to build their capacity to incorporate climate risk into their systems and frameworks, which ensures their financial systems are resilient, stable, and inclusive in order to protect their country's citizens. Our mission is sponsored by our key funders, Global Affairs Canada since day one, Swedish CETA, and the IMF. These leading organizations share our vision for promoting financial stability and fostering financial inclusion to develop more sustainable economies and reduce poverty. We are pleased to have assembled such an esteemed global panel. They all have impeccable credentials as outlined in their bios, which we won't read. Let me underscore that Chairperson Neza Hayat of the Moroccan Capital Markets Authority and Governor Anthony uh, sorry, Timothy Antoine 
of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank are very well-respected international figures in their world of financial sector governance. Each of them has partnered with Toronto Centre to hold the first ever programs on greening capital markets and climate risk in their respective regions. And in fact, these were the first programs that any capacity building provider ever offered. We're also happy to make a new friend in Professor Anthony Neong of the African Development Bank who's named among the top 20 most influential people in climate policy. His perspective will round out the discussion. I had the privilege of interacting with Deputy Minister Christine Hogan when she was the head of the Canadian, Caribbean, and Irish delegation to the World Bank. As one of the very top federal officials, she doesn't require introductions in this city. Plus, she moderated a Toronto Centre event, Decoding FinTech and Capturing Opportunities for Financial Inclusion and Gender Equality during the Women Deliver Conference in Vancouver last year. Because she did such a stellar job, she's here again, and she was our a plus choice for today's event. In fact, we deliberately decided not to have a plan B. So Christine, if you were not here, this, pilot, this uh, panel would have been on autopilot. Sans plus tarder, je cède le micro à la sous-ministre, Madame Hogan, pour lancer la discussion. J'espère que notre présentation vous plaira. Merci. I, I have full confidence that this could have easily been a self-moderated panel, but I'm more than delighted to, uh, to be here. Um, and uh, to support the work of, uh, of the Toronto Centre and to have, a, I think, what's going to be in a very interesting conversation about something that's uh, extremely topical um, around greening finance. Uh, so thanks very much, Babak, for the uh, very generous uh, introduction. And uh, thank you to the Toronto Centre and to all the partners uh, behind it for, uh, for organizing uh, to have us here today. It really is encouraging to see more and more conversations of this kind around Ottawa um, and around uh, the world. I think uh, we're uh, on uh, the beginnings of a conversation that will receive more and more focus uh, in the years ahead. Les répercussions des changements climatiques se, sont, euh, se font le plus euh, et en plus et en plus entière dans le monde entier. Il sera essentiel de se préparer et de s'adapter à ces répercussions pour gérer les risques auxquels font face nos entreprises, nos collectivités et nos écosystèmes. There's little doubt really that the effects of, uh, of climate change are uh, preoccupying all of us. Uh, more and more each day, and uh, I think preparing, in fact, for, for some of us on the panel, for colleagues on the panel, this isn't about preparing, it's about living um, with the realities of, of climate change, but more importantly, managing those risks uh, for our businesses, for our communities, governments, and of course, for our ecosystems. Now, I'm also going to invoke uh, Mark Carney, um, because he has become a, a very important uh, voice on issues of sustainable finance. And uh, if you go back to 2015, when referring to climate change, uh, he said that actually once climate change becomes an issue of financial stability, we may have gone far too far. So I think it's important to uh, heed those words and uh, convene as many of these conversations and, and draw out the expertise that, uh, that exists. Uh, little question that climate change is and will have transformative economic impacts and implications for financial stability. And as a result, financial supervisors and regulators need to take greater consideration of climate risks and opportunities. Uh, recognizing the importance of these issues, and maybe just a note on the Canadian context, back in 2018, um, together, uh, then Minister of Environment and Climate Change, uh, Catherine McKenna, and the Minister of Finance, Bill Morneau, um, launched an expert panel uh, on sustainable finance, which reported uh, last year and this was, uh, I think, uh, the first serious look into these issues from a, from a Canadian point of view, from uh, the perspective of Canada's financial markets and uh, the level of engagement in that process was, was, uh, was excellent. And uh, we're continuing to work with the, the members of the panel as, as they continue to refine their thinking. Also encouraged to see that the Bank of Canada is also a, a mover on these issues and joined the network for greening the financial system in March of 2019. 
The bank has recognized climate-related risks and vulnerabilities for the first time in their financial system review in, 20, in May of 2019 and is undertaking a multi-year uh, research plan focused on climate change. And as well, uh, Canada's bank and insurance supervisor, OSFI, the Office of, for the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, joined the Sustainable Insurance Forum uh, in October of last year. So it's a great opportunity for me today to be joined by Governor Antoine, by Neza Hayet, and by Anthony Nyong, um, three very thoughtful thinkers on these issues. Um, Governor Antoine, I have to disclose, is uh, been a very uh, close colleague of mine during my time at the World Bank. Um, and uh, he is, of course, the governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, uh, the monetary authority for eight amazing Caribbean countries, small island states. Uh, he's also a proud native of Grenada and an economist and a development practitioner. Um, Neza Hayat is the chairperson and the CEO of the Moroccan Capital Market Authority, also the vice chair of the African and Middle East Committee within the International Organization of Securities Commissions. And I think uh, one of the leading thinkers around the role of women in the financial sector. And we're really looking forward to hearing your perspectives on, on that and the leadership that you've provided and some of the lessons that you've, that you've learned. And Anthony Nyong is the Director of Climate Change and Green Growth at the African uh, Development Bank, uh, formerly of IDRC, uh, and of course a graduate of McMaster, so wonderful Canadian connections, mm -hmm. and a leading author of the IPCC's fourth assessment uh, report. So really um, a very impressive group of, of folks. And so enough from me. Uh, I think it's uh, best that we dive right in and and uh, and uh, get the perspectives of our of our panelists today. So I'm going to put a question to each of you in turn. You'll take about six minutes and respond, and then and then we'll do that for each of you, and then we'll open the floor for a first round of of discussions. So as you know, this year's International Development Week um, has a theme of go for the goals. I don't think I need to tell anybody here what goals those might be. Um, and uh, so the first question is really a broad one, which is from each of your perspectives, how can financial supervisors and regulators meet organizational objectives as well as the SDGs? How do you combine these two uh, imperatives that are on all of our minds in 2020? So for you, Governor Antoine, SDG 8 uh, aims at inclusive and sustainable economic growth. Uh, and given the fact that the global economy is growing, at a slower rate, and as the governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, how do you see these challenges manifesting and playing themselves out within the Caribbean context? <clears throat> so thank you, Christine. Um, I want to start by just uh, recognizing the contribution of Canada and its leadership to development uh, globally, and also particularly its contribution to the Caribbean. Secondly, I do want to publicly thank you for your stellar service to our region when you served as executive director. We are sorry to lose you, but the government of Canada called and of course we, we understood. Uh, and thirdly, just to thank the Toronto Centre for the, the partnership and for putting this event together. So at this moment, the global economy is slowing and in the Caribbean, there, there are three principal channels of transmission uh, that concern us. It's impact on tourism, remittances, and to a lesser extent, foreign direct investment. So in sum, this development is likely to dim the economic and socioeconomic prospects of our region. And there are three issues that are particular. I mean, the Caribbean has many issues that, 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 that challenge us, but three issues that I, I want to highlight very briefly on this, is, on this question. One is the high debt, low, grab tra low debt trap in which we find ourselves two, high unemployment, and three, climate change or climate crisis. So the reality is that our region is caught in a high debt logo trap. Over the last three decades, we've seen growth consistently decline from 6% in the 1980s to 3.3% in the 1990s to 2.7% in the, in the 2000s and then 1.6% in the last decade. So it's been steady, a steady decline. At the same time that the debt, that the growth has been declining, the debt has been rising. Uh, in fact, 
on account of loss of preferential <coughs> for sugar and bananas, uh, less concessional financing because we are graduating from low income to middle income and in some cases high income. And as a natural disasters, debt has increased. Uh, debt peaked in our region, ECCU, at 91% in 2004. So low growth, high debt. You see the challenge. And that then creates its own ceiling, if you will, on our growth prospects. The good news, however, is that we've been working really hard to reduce our debt load, our debt overhang. So that at the end of last year, our debt had come down to 6, 6 to 5% of uh, debt to GDP ratio of 6 to 5%. Our target is to be under 60 by 2030. And two countries, St. Kitts and Grenada, have already made that target, or just about. So that is the first challenge we have with the with the, so any any reduction in global growth is likely to put further strain on us in terms of our, our trajectory for our trajectory for uh, growth and our growth prospects. The second issue is high unemployment, especially amongst our youth. I don't know if people recognize that, but in the Caribbean we have a problem of high high unemployment, and in fact the youth unemployment is particularly high and doubles the national average. So if nationally is twenty percent, amongst the youth it's forty percent. And that creates its own social pathologies, as you could well imagine. So you've seen some uptick in crime and, and deviant behavior on account of that. When I was growing up, it used to be said that poverty was about lack of education opportunities. Today in the Caribbean, a lot of our poverty has to do with lack of employment opportunities. That's a big change. So, and there is, there are high, uh, you know, significant pockets of poverty in some of our countries. I mean, in St. Lucia, for example, uh, poverty is 25%. So the story of these per, per capita income you know, masks what is going on underneath. You have to go underneath. You have to dig below to see what is going on there. And then, of course, the third issue uh, is, is climate, the climate crisis. Three facts about the Caribbean. One, that we are, in fact, among the lowest emitters but the hardest hit by climate change. And as Mary Robinson, the former president mm -hmm. of, 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 Iraq, of, of Ireland, and the current UN High Commission on, on, on Human Rights said, it is a grave injustice that the countries that contribute least to climate change should be the worst or high, hardest impacted. So that's one. Secondly, we're one of the most tourist dependent regions in the world. So again, if you think about what global slowdown means for tourism, you see the challenge. And thirdly, we have seen, we have witnessed an increasing fre frequency and ferocity of storms. In fact, we had the monster storms in 2017. We're still recovering from that. And then in 2019 in the Bahamas with, with Dorian. So those are some of the challenges that immediately confront us with a global slowdown. And uh, of course, we are determined to do our very best with our partners to, to mitigate, to counter as best as, as possible. But the challenge is that as we make these strides towards the sustainable development goals, these are the things which can easily reverse those gains. And these are the things that we have to work, uh, work to, 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 to minimize this impact as we, as we press forward with SGD8. Uh, at the end of the day, we really believe that employment in particular is key to inclusive growth. Uh, and if we have to fulfill SGD8, then we have to be able to tackle our youth. And perhaps later on in the conversation, I could share some ideas about what we're doing there. Perfect. That's excellent. All right, so now we'll turn to uh, Nazra uh, Hayat and uh, have uh, a little bit of your perspective. Um, obviously, an uh, important leader within your organization and, and a female leader at that, as I understand, the first woman ever on the board of a bank in, uh, in bank Morocco. Area. And um, and also, uh, I think uh, what you mentioned to me before, uh, sort of your pathway to, to get there, how you've kind of... Uh, made your way into uh, into those kinds of positions of, of leadership. So we'd really welcome hearing from from you as to how you see gender equality playing into these uh, into these issues. Of course, SDG five is uh, focused on gender equality. Um, and uh, for purposes of our, our discussion today, gender equality in the financial sector is often uh, a major challenge. Um, so we'd really welcome your perspective, your, a little bit of your story of, of your experience, but also um, your thoughts on how we might be able to close the gender gap when it comes to greening the financial sector. Okay, thank you. I first wanted to thank uh, Toronto Centre for 
giving me the opportunity to speak in this uh, prestigious panel and to share all our experience in Morocco regarding the issue of greening uh, uh, capital markets. So for your question, just I want to tell you that I come from a country where, uh, uh, where many major actions have been taken under the leadership of His Majesty Mohammed VI in order to improve uh, women's rights. Uh, the, the first uh, uh, important reform was the Family Code, adopted in 2004, and which granted important uh, more rights to, to women regarding matters such as uh, marriage, uh, divorce, child custody, inherited, inheritance. And uh, with this uh, strong uh, will of uh, inclu uh, uh, an inclusive, having inclusive policy that will uh, 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 integrate everyone, and especially women. Uh, today, there is a national uh, uh, national policy for financial inclusion that targets uh, essentially women and youth uh, for employment. So uh, let me say a few words of my personal experience on these issues. First, before becoming a regulator, I was a banker, and uh, I wanted to... Uh, well, to be part uh, first, uh, well, I wanted to have a, a career as good as uh, as uh, for men. So, I, and uh, also, uh, I wanted to contribute to promoting women in the Moroccan economy through NGOs. So, after first experience with other women uh, uh, creating the the association, which is very important today, AFEM Association of Moroccan Women uh, Business Business Women in two in two thousand, uh, uh, with the purpose of uh, helping identifying uh, creating a network and helping women to create their own or, or to manage uh, companies. I I found out that it was. It was uh, the, this initiative was very important, but was not addressing issues for those women who were making a career in big companies. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was uh, it was uh, even uh, while in in many studies uh, we would uh, we would find out that women after a certain level would uh, in order to become the the boss would have to leave and create their own company. And uh, so in 2012, with the with four other uh, co uh, four other ladies uh, that were holding a major senior position in the financial sector, we decided to contribute to 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 improve uh, uh, well to 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 lobby and uh, raise awareness about the the necess uh, the gender equality within uh, in the companies. We created. Uh, Sefa uh, Maroc, which was the club of uh, uh, women directors, mm -hmm. to promote women on boards, especially boards of listed uh, listed companies, and uh, uh, and uh, we chose and uh, we chose the, the strategy to explain that this gender issue had more to do with good governance for companies and with the uh, improving competitiveness and good governance of companies rather than simply uh, improving the the presence of women in uh, in uh, senior in management uh, in management boards and uh, uh, the first success we had uh, was that the first regulator who followed and who did something was our central bank governor who uh, understood quickly and required from banks to have equ uh, gender equality among the independent directors. So this is how it. Uh, uh, this is the experience as uh, NGO. And when I had the chance to be appointed as a head of capital uh, market authority, I, I followed the uh, followed the same path, which I probably uh, in. Uh, in uh, improving ESG requirements and uh, uh, through which the uh, uh, 
uh, through which the, the issue of gender equality is is tackled in the in the ESG reports mm -hmm. and uh, uh, also in raising awareness uh, uh, among the CEO of listed companies uh, to include diversity within their board of directors. Diversity, including, I mean, means, but it's not exclusive, means gender. Uh, well, great. Thank you. So, very briefly, you know, to respect the six. I minutes. have, I have, I have two hours of follow-up questions for you. <laughs> um, I, uh, in my own experience, for example, when I was at the World Bank, I, um, I chaired a group uh, focused on um, diversity of, of even our own board um, at the World Bank Group um, and the importance of uh, just making the business arguments for why a diverse and gender uh, balanced uh, board leads typically to better decisions, better outcomes for an organization. So the, the case is there, the economics, the business case is there, but we still seem to have, uh, mm -hmm. have challenges. So maybe we can talk a little bit more about yeah. that. Um, Mr. Nyong, it's up to you now for the for my last kind of introductory question. And thank you again for joining us. It's great to have uh, such a diverse panel. And, and uh, you serve right now as the Director of Climate Change and Green Growth at the African Development Bank. So a lot of expectations on your shoulders for, uh, for how Africa's development will be sustainable and green. And um, I wonder if you could talk uh, to us as to how you say, how you um, think about SDG 13, which is the Combating Climate Change SDG, um, and how you see Africa's progress in this regard. Um, and what are the main challenges when, when you're working with your, uh, your member countries to uh, incorporate climate change into, for instance, their financial regulatory and supervisory frameworks? Yeah, thank you so very much, Christine, and thanks to Toronto Centre for inviting uh, my team. Let me note here that Canada is a very strong member of the African Development Bank, so it's our bank. You know, I thought I should say that because um, few, you know, very few people know that it's not just a bank owned by African countries. We have 54 African owners and 27 non-African owners, and Canada is one of the top non-African owners. But having said that, um, let me note here again that um, Africa basically contributes about less than 4% of total global greenhouse gas emissions. 54 African countries contribute just about 3% of the total emissions, but bears a very disproportionate impact, as you can imagine. And for the SDG 13, and beyond, Africa has plugged itself as a solution provider. We're not sitting down, we're not playing the blame game. We believe that we have a contribution to make to solve global problems. And some of the things we've done, for instance, 54 African countries have all signed the nationally determined contributions. 51 have ratified them. These are very ambitious targets. South and Principle, for instance, are give a very small, small island developing country state whose emissions by 2040 would be 240 kilotons, but has made a target to sequester 400 kilotons, almost twice what it emits by that year. This shows the levels of ambition that African countries have put forward there. But having said that, the countries in Africa are facing very severe threats of climate change. And like I've said, they are taking, you know, making serious efforts to address in this. One is that the African Union has established regional programs to help countries, like the Africa Disaster Risk Reduction Strategy that is being implemented. The second is that countries themselves are uh, mainstreaming more and more of climate change into their national strategies. You know, the bank is helping them in doing this. We also have situations where the African Development Bank has been able to come out there to help the African countries. 
After ratifying these NDCs, these nationally determined contributions, most of the countries reached out to the African Development Bank. How can you help us make sense of this? So we established the Africa NDC Support Hub that provides technical assistance to countries to help them in mainstreaming climate change strategies or the NDCs international strategies, which is one of the uh, targets of the SDGs. What we found happening was we had a situation where African countries saw the NDCs as that document that donors have asked us to prepare that they will finance. And then they have their national strategies. And we thought that wasn't good enough, that we need to mainstream those NDCs into national development strategies. So that's what we're helping them do. Many countries are also developing long-term strategies to see where they would get to by 2050 for a carbon neutral or a decarbonized society. So this is it. But then they're also faced with challenges. The latest uh, climate policy initiatives report shows that between 2016, 2018 on average, only 3% of the global climate finance was programmed in Africa. Sometimes I wonder what Africa has to do with the number three, 3% emissions, 3% global finance. And we think this is really very poor. So what we've done is that we are also setting up initiatives that will help them access more finances from these uh, funds. We have what we call the ADRIFI, the Africa Disaster Risk Reduction Initiative that you know, is conceptualizing a very innovative way of helping African countries to pay insurance premiums to you know, buffer their risk. Because we are seeing so many um, public expenditure displacements taking place. Countries, when disasters happen, have to take, nobody plans for disaster. When it happens, they take money from education, from health, from whatever to address this issue. So we're dealing with that. And we also realize that Africa has less than one eighth of the minimum number of meteorological stations required for development. So we have a massive program that we are strengthening the African regional climate centers to be able to generate good quality data, disseminate this data, and then use them for national planning purposes. So there's a lot that is going on there. While African countries are doing this, we still think there is more that needs to be done. We also believe that adaptation is not static. Resilience is not static. You adapt to a signal. So we think it is important that high emitters while Africa is building adaptive capacity, high emitters should be working towards bringing down their emissions at the same time. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna open it up for uh, some questions and, uh, and comments. So the first, the first round, it was kind of identifying a few of the SDGs and uh, kind of uh, getting a sense of, of just how at a practical level, uh, financial regulators and financial supervisors are kind of internalizing this new global set of goals in terms of uh, their day-to-day -day work. There's lots more we can drill into that, but uh, if people want to pick up on, on that line of inquiry and we can pose some questions. Oh, sure. Thank you. Oh my God, my voice is loud. Um, <laughs> So when you're talking about the, I guess, the three key factors for uh, the Caribbean in terms of you know, foreign direct investment, employment, and you know, promoting tourism, I suppose, um, it seems like climate change really catches you in a bind and greening the financing system might catch you in a bind as well in terms of if you're looking at making the financial system more adequately consider climate change issues, would that not also maybe liven the financial system more to the risks of, say, foreign direct investment in the Caribbean if now they're more alive to like, well, there's more hurricanes that'll occur in the Caribbean, there's a uh, greater risk of damage and you know your higher insurance premiums, is that not going to have a negative impact, impact on the ability of the Caribbean to be bringing in greater foreign direct investment. I don't know if you see that as a challenge or an opportunity, but. Okay, let me see if there's another question and we can take a couple. Any others? 
Thank you for your presentations. Um, I'd like to try to merge the experience that Ms. Hyatt, you've shared with us in terms of how you are trying to convince the financial system to uh, not green itself, but uh, address the, the, the blindness, the gender inequities that are there that are holding it back. And the challenge that, that I see of getting all of the financial structures out there to recognize that the blindnesses that they have represent huge threats and missed opportunities. Um, you've all discussed very different circumstances, but they're all similar in the sense of the day-to-day the -day development challenges predominate. When we're aiming to green the financial system, we're actually asking financial regulators, the, the, the entire ecosystem of the players, to take a look beyond their day-to-day -day challenges and recognize something that would fundamentally force them to revisit their, their entire business model. How do you get that started? I mean, it's hard enough to demonstrate materiality of women on boards, although there are some very strong examples of how that does increase diversity in decision-making and make, make more profits. How do we get started in convincing governments in their national development spending, convincing regulatory or organizations to start looking at these very apparently intangible impacts on the climate side? Okay, do you wanna take the first one, Governor Antoine? And maybe Mr. Nyong, I'll ask you to maybe comment similarly from an African perspective. I think there's a lot of countries in Africa who are facing some of the similar challenges, particularly disaster prone and, and what, that, uh, what that might mean. So maybe the two of you could take that first question and Ms. Hyatt, the second. Right, so thank you, Christine. Thank you for the question. Um, so your question really, amplifies the fact that for us in the region, the climate crisis is an existential threat. That's why we feel so urgent about this issue. On the current trajectory, some of our islands could be underwater by 2100. And that may seem like a long time for some of us, except that if you recall Y2K, that was 20 years ago, meaning that time goes very fast. So we're concerned about that. And that's why we are our focus is on building resilience, building resilience. And I can you know, go into the areas where we're actually building resilience. Perhaps we'll, we'll get into some of that as the, as the mm -hmm. panel ensues. Uh, but, 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 but the issue of insurance is a real issue. I mean, after the hurricanes in 2017, we had a situation there where some of our hotels were facing extremely high insurance premium. So much so that other than labor, that was the, the next biggest cost. So there could be a situation, a scenario where they cannot buy insurance. That is how serious that is. Now, in the meantime, what we're trying to do is to build resilience on the ground to reduce the risk parameters and therefore to try to get the pricing. But you know how the insurance works. If they get a, a loss this year, they're going to make up for it the following year. So that's a real issue for us. Um, but in addition to that, the other area that we are pursuing, which of course is controversial, but some of our countries are doing it, uh, is citizenship by investment programs to try to bring in foreign direct investment. And that has helped some countries like St. Kitts. If you look at the infrastructure there, it is better than many countries, and that's the big reason why. But that's a sovereign decision, and it, it has its pressures. And, and so it is not an easy fix. But at the end of the day, whether it is citizenship by investment programs or medicinal marijuana, all the Caribbean is really trying to do is to find a way to make a, a livelihood. And that is the challenge that we continue to face. Do you want to comment on that from a perspective of the African Development Bank and some of your uh, borrowing country clients? Yeah, uh, thanks so much. I think it's, uh, for us, it's basically a double jeopardy because at the global level, international conferences, name them, even the World Economic Forum, which just finished, everything here about is carbon you know, mitigation, how do you bring down emissions and so on. And yet we have a very large population that is facing these threats, like the governor has mentioned. How no very little attention is paid to this group. And we think it is important that we deal with this. We had Malawi is not a coastal nation. It's never experienced hurricanes, but we had Hurricane Idai 
that swept it. And we're asking, who next? Which means even the hinterland countries are not safe. So there's a lot that we think needs to be done. We need to pay more attention to resilience building. Africa spent about 2% of its GDP dealing with the aftermath of climate disasters. This is huge. Even though we're saying, if we put in that 2% upfront, we might be able to save a lot more down the stream. So that's where we are. But let me also add here that um, in the first question you asked, part of why what uh, we've seen, the challenges that African institutions are having, regulators and so on, in addressing climate change or building climate change. In you know, we have this conversation as we speak Many people in the finance sector still think that climate change is an environmental threat. They distance themselves. They still have not gotten to the point of seeing it's beyond the environment. That it has to do with the entire economy and that the financial sector has a role to play. So we're still having this dialogue, you know, of how do we get the finance sector to take this matter up. And one of those challenges they have is the lack of data. Or lack of awareness, they don't know. Then they have the lack of data. Even if they want to do it, they don't know how to do it. They don't know what data is available out there. We are very weak. I was surprised to know that many African financial institutions are not even Basel co uh, compliant. So they don't even have the luxury that we're talking about in, uh, in uh, addressing issues of environment, gender, you know, social development, mainstreaming them into that. So there's a lot that needs to be done from the African perspective to get the financial sector on. But then for the international community, there's a lot that they still need to do to work with African countries. Let's raise ambition in adaptation. I've had people tell me, look, you guys, when you put your acts together, come back to us. When you give me a long range of uncertainty, it could be five meters, it could be one meter high. Um, sea level rise. What do I plan for? Do I plan for one meter? Do I plan for five meters? Mm -hmm. And my question has always been, the best of the economists tells you all things being equal, then they give you a proposition. And we know in real life, all things are never equal. We believe that. So why can't we believe the climate change specialist that tells you this might happen? Good. Okay, Ms. Hayat, did you want to react to the question at the back? Uh, okay, so... Uh, for your question, well, in Morocco, uh, the, the, the aim, the challenge is not to convince government or regulators to, to tackle the issue of, uh, of sustainability. It's rather how government and regulators, how they can implement a, a, more, uh, a more sustainable uh, economic, uh, strategy for a more sustainable economy. And, uh, and how to convince and raise awareness ab among the rest of the stakeholders. Let me give you an example of what we have done then as a regulator, because of the, what I, I, I talked about before was my experience as on the side of NGOs. But when I became a regulator, we, uh, we, we addressed, we had first to address the, the issue of uh, green capital markets uh, and uh, I was, ju I had just arrived and I needed to, to reinforce the role of the capital market authority, not only as the watchdog, not only as the uh, authority that protects uh, investors and, uh, and uh, uh, that uh, make sure that, uh, that uh, the market is, uh, the rules uh, are respected, but also with the ambition of contributing to develop the capital markets with the capital markets having to play a greater role in the financing of the economy. So when I arrived in 2016, the, the, the year the COP22 was held in Marrakesh and uh, uh, it, was the, it was the occasion for government uh, together with the, uh, with the regulators, the three regulators for the financial sector, including Central Bank, Capital Market Authority, Insurance uh, uh, insurance uh, control authorities, banks, and uh, uh, and uh, investors uh, 
uh, it was the occasion to build a national roadmap with specific actions. Uh, regarding uh, the Capital Markets Authority, we started, uh, we, we said, how do, how do we start? We started with guidelines for green bond framework and to implement uh, green bonds using the, uh, the, uh, the best international standards. We were helped uh, uh, in this uh, first uh, guidelines uh, by IFC. Uh, we had the, and that was the, the uh, that, that was our first uh, 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 action to uh, uh, to create uh, to help create the framework for new instruments. Uh, as regards, uh, the, this is one example. Another example, as regards well, women and improving the presence of women on boards or, or in management positions, we have had a progressive approach to include. ESG reporting by our uh, uh, by issuers, not only listed company, but all issuers. We started with guidelines explaining what a, what are the what, what is the ESG report board. Having then Casablanca Stock Exchange launch an ESG index, and progressively lately uh, last year we amended we amended our rule book and made mandatory the publication of the ESG reporting, the first uh, w w uh, and uh, switching from voluntary to mandatory. We will have our first report uh, uh, at, the, at uh, April from all this company. But since then, this, uh, we have already seen progress in this three years. Uh, for instance, uh, the number of uh, women on boards has uh, the percentage has doubled. Before that, uh, only they represented only seven percent of uh, directors. Today, it's uh, thirteen percent. And I'm sure that now that we made mandatory this uh, report, that includes also how the policies to improve uh, women and all uh, all other policies regarding uh, inv impact, uh, environmental impact, and uh, uh, good good governance. I'm sure that. The uh, all the we will me uh, and uh, uh, this we will have measurable indicators uh, that I'm sure will improve. So, That's great. great. Maybe we can turn now to a few questions that will kind of allow you to speak to some of the regional or national experiences, the the sort of toolkit that you've been uh, helping to adapt from your own perspective. So, Governor Antoine. Um, you know, we hear a lot of discussion in the climate space about the particular challenges of small island developing states. You already touched on them. And um, really the fact that they are on the front lines of, of climate and you talk about, you know, their contribution in terms of emissions, but the impact is disproportionate and, and it being an existential question for many in, in um, places like the Caribbean, but not exclusively other small islands in the Pacific and elsewhere. Maybe you could just share for us um, a few of what I think are very path-breaking um, thinking measures that have emerged um, within the Caribbean, some of the local regional initiatives that, that the ECCB has been, been championing in this space, new toolkits that are kind of gaining traction in the multilateral development banks that we can hopefully see being um, replicated and expanded into other places where applicable. Thanks, Christine. So after the monster storms in 2017. The Caribbean community, a collection of Caribbean countries, took a decision, declared its ambition to become the first climate resilient region in the world. It's a big ambition, but given where we live, we have to do something. So since then, several of our countries are now embarked on national resist re resilience strategies and they're getting support from the World Bank, for example. Of course, Canada is a big contributor to that, uh, to build that out. The second area is in the area of fiscal resilience. And this is where ECCB has been playing a very important role in advocating with our members for fiscal, what some people call fiscal rules, fiscal responsibility frameworks, but what I prefer to call fiscal resilience frameworks, which is essentially building in a mechanism that allows you to, as I tell the countries, to embark on conquer cyclical fiscal policy when there's a downturn in the economy. What you, when you watch what happened after the 
global financial crisis in the Caribbean, the Caribbean entered into a deep recession. And part of the reason for that was not just what was going on on the external front, but at a time when the government should have been spending more to cushion the effects on the vulnerable, they were actually spending less. How do I know? Because I was one of them as a financial secretary then doing exactly that. Not the very smartest thing to do, but without fiscal space, we had no options. So we, we make the point for building fiscal buffers so that the governments have that fiscal uh, space to operate counter-cyclical fiscal policy for fiscal resilience. Two countries so far in my uh, eight country group have already gone that way, and three others are in serious conversation. I'm hoping to get to critical number five and then get everybody <laughs> over the line. It's going to take some doing, but we're committed to doing that. Another area is, is in the area of financial resilience. Uh, so this is the use of risk transfer mechanisms. At the moment, two-thirds of all losses in the Caribbean are uninsured. Two-thirds, uninsured. So that is where, for example, the Caribbean Cadastral Risk Insurance Facility becomes important. Canada has been a very important contributor to that. Um, so far, this was established in 2007, the first multi-country catastrophe risk pool in the world. Uh, we've now expanded to, I think, 22 countries, uh, including three countries in Central America. Over that period of time, we've disbursed in excess of 150 million US dollars, and we do so within 14 days of an event. So it's been a success. The challenge is that we need to scale that up, because like I mentioned, two-thirds of all losses are currently uninsured. So that's an area where we are looking to expand, uh, but it, it's a combination of fiscal space and also the requisite support to build capital. Another area is the use of disaster-linked clauses in our loan contracts, what in the Caribbean we commonly call hurricane clauses. And you played a very important role in your, your time at the World Bank in working on that. Essentially, what we say is this. In the event of a major disaster, there ought to be a standstill for a specified period of time on debt servicing to allow the country to recover and then having recovered to resume servicing. Because typically what happens after disaster is that you have to reallocate resources that you don't have. The promised pledges, seldom arrive, or if they arrive, they're not in time. And in the meantime, your capacity to grow and recover is compromised. So invest in re recovery and then resume. We now have that, those clauses in Grenada. We have them in St. Lucia. We have them in Barbados. Uh, and I know one or two other countries are going to be doing that. Uh, Canada was very important in the G7 in encouraging that at the level of the Paris Club and in the G7 discussion. And I'm grateful for that because, again, we feel that is important to help us build up what, we, what we're doing. Very quickly on the ECCB side, we continue to encourage mitigation in respect of renewables in our energy mix. At the moment, only 8% of our electricity come from, comes from uh, renewables. And we've said we need, to, we need to do more. So at the central bank, our small campus, we've set a target to be carbon neutral by 2022. And by June of this year, we'll be 60% there. We made the investment and we begin to see the results. Not just in our bottom line, but to be honest with you, the motivation is to set a moral example and to have the moral authority to make the argument to larger countries and larger emitters, you need to do more. If we are small countries that do our part, shame on you. And I'm, I make no apologies for saying that. It's a matter of life survival for us. Shame on you. You need to do more. Do your part to ensure that we can protect our planet. Excellent. So I'll leave it at that. That's great. No, that's... <laughs> Did anybody learn anything new in that little... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's, it's been... Sadly, crises have spurred a lot of uh, the policy innovation and the, and the adjustments that we're seeing and the recognition of the need to develop new fiscal and financial tools. So it's, it's uh, lots of hard work and, and investment on uh, the part of many great thinkers to, to get to this point. And we need to continue to spur innovation um, uh, in, this, in this space as we go, as we go forward. Um, Maybe from the Moroccan point of view. So a number of people have mentioned to me the famous uh, Marrakesh Pledge. So the Moroccan Capital Market Authority um, launched that initiative. And I wonder if you could just share with the, with the audience here what that, what that pledge is all about 
And um, whether you think it's going to be adequate um, in terms of the regulatory and legislative framework that, that's uh, still coming um, in, your, in your region and in, in, in Morocco. So we're keen to learn about the Marrakesh pledge. Okay. Well, then it, uh, it all started during COP22, and I was, uh, we understood that that COP22 was not only the COP for Africa, but also the COP that would uh, afford, uh, that will talk about financing and how to finance all these uh, uh, projects that uh, will uh, to mitigate climate risk and how to attract funds. And uh, uh, not all, I mean, in, on the African continent. So we, we, we decided together with other, we, with other regulators and exchanges from the continent to, uh, to launch this Mar initiative called the Marrakech Pledge that was signed during COP22. In fact, it's a call for all African regulators and exchanges to act collectively and individually to build that an African partnership at foster, aimed at fostering green capital markets in Africa uh, with uh, try, uh, trying to with, uh, enable the development of an effective ecosystem to support the establishment of green capital markets, promote Africa as a prominent region for green financial markets, uh, enable uh, other African-led in, uh, innovative climate finance initiatives, both globally or for Africa, and also create a venue for exchange knowledge and experience sharing among ex African exchanging and regulators. And what we have done by, by all committing, uh, committing to date, uh, 23 countries have signed latest uh, one uh, uh, joined the, the pledge is Mauritius uh, exchange and the regulators joined recently the the because it, it's it's a commitment to act and uh, it has been I think very useful for all uh, regulators and exchanges of the continent uh, because we ha we uh, by building for instance when we build this first guideline on green bonds trying to explain uh, all the challenges to give uh, the uh, an international definition of what is green what could, what is green uh, explain the, the procedures to uh, be, to to issue green bonds uh, uh, also explain the the use of uh, um, external auditors that will uh, uh, that will assess that the project is green. I mean, all these uh, uh, all these details to uh, uh, for for an issuer to be able to come with with a green bond. Uh, well, these uh, these guidelines has through the market place been used by other regulators, and that we have helped and have uh, have enabled not only issues in Morocco of green bonds, but also in other African countries. And some cancer markets that we have helped through this pledge are advancing as in terms of number of e e issues. It also has enabled us in Africa to, to reinforce our capital markets and to, to explain that capital markets are, are very useful uh, to finance the economy. It's not only a question of, of a few top uh, uh, comp national companies uh, listed, but it can uh, it can attract uh, it can finance many kind of projects, and uh, it helped attract uh, to attract new investors mm -hmm. uh, looking for for a more ethical, for more sustainability uh, uh, in in the market. So, and this uh, this pledge is is going on. We we uh, we had that that first. Uh, a uh, very important uh, well uh, conference with a uh, workshop with Toronto Center and uh, uh, that uh, uh, was uh, organized for for the members of the uh, of the Marrakesh pledge and uh, at the end we had uh, well a white paper which we 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 released and uh, we published on uh, on our experiences and uh, recommendations and perspectives on uh, 
on developing green capital markets in Africa. Great. Thanks. I, you know, I want to come back to the issue of blue bonds, green bonds, and, and the promise that we all see, but also maybe I'll uh, we'll come back and ask each of you to comment on some of the impediments. Why, why are we not seeing faster take up of some of these instruments? And uh, so maybe you can think about that and I'll come back to you. Um, Mr. Nyong, uh, from the African Development Bank's perspective, there's also been uh, some new initiatives. Um, the African Financial Alliance on Climate Change like every good initiative, there's a good acronym, the AFAC, is that what you call it? Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe you could share a little bit about what, what that's all about. And um, maybe more specifically, I think the, the audience would really welcome hearing your, your views on the specific actions that financial sector supervisors can take to encourage this shift in financial sector portfolios. Um, again, it gets to the point about how do we accelerate um, this effort, given the pace at which we're seeing um, climate uh, change, and you mentioned yourself the need for resilience, adaptation, all of these things. So, what can we what can we do, or what are you thinking about in terms of your relationship with financial sector supervisors to really encourage the shift um, of financial sector portfolios towards low carbon, climate resilient investments? Yeah, thanks uh, so much. Um, all research, all reports show that, you know, that 75% uh, or more of the resources that are needed to address climate change will come from the private sector, that everyone agrees. But we realize that in Africa, the private sector, there is not so much the big multinationals. We have the financial institutions largely, and then the small and medium scale enterprises. So the trick then was, how do we get these financial institutions to put money together to support climate action in Africa. Uh, the first is that uh, there are opportunities for which they don't know or are not fully aware of. I'll give you an instance. Last year, no, 2018, we had $11 trillion divested from fossil fuel, which means this money has to go somewhere the financial institutions can position themselves to receive such monies and do something better. On the African continent, the countries have submitted nationally determined contributions. When you look at it, it's $3 trillion by 2030. And we say this is not $3 trillion in sunk costs. This is investment opportunity in Africa. This is a market, you know, that they have a $3 trillion market. This Part of this market will need to be financed by local capital, domestic resources. And we have pension funds, insurances, central banks, name them, sitting on trillions of dollars, not doing much with it. So we thought it was important to bring this together. That's how we created the Africa Financial Alliance on Climate Change, by bringing all these owners and purveyors of capital on the continent to one platform. The issues of the commercial bank cannot be addressed by the commercial banks, probably by the central banks. And the central banks cannot do much without the ministers of finance. So it has a good steering committee chaired by Lord Nixon and the finance minister of Rwanda, because we see that Rwanda is doing quite a lot and it has several other things that it is doing. So that's where we are. Right now we're building awareness amongst uh, those financial institutions. Many of them don't, like I mentioned earlier, can't really relate with climate change. It's now that we're doing this sensitization, their eyes are beginning to be open to say, wow, I think I can see myself here. And I really look forward to a partnership with the Toronto Center because this is really your bread and butter, that we can work together to uh, create that awareness, build that capacity within African financial institutions. And for us, what is it that we want to see the uh, financial institutions do, either the regulators or the supervisors? One is insistence on the assessment of risks and disclosure of these risks, whether they are uh, climate risk, static, or uh, transition risk. All the risks that are associated with climate change need to be put. 
we need to see stronger regulatory environments. We lack this largely in Africa. We have conflicting policies. You have on one hand, the Minister of Finance that says they want to get a lot more money through imposing high uh, excise duties, customs and excise duties. That way you are hindering the ability to import renewable energy technologies. How can we have differential loan pricing, all that products, for instance, that can come on board? So I think it is absolutely very important that we begin to disclose. And I know that this disclosure can bring a risk to itself. And so I don't, I'm not one of those that believes because it worked in Japan, it must work in Burundi in Africa. We need to have tailored solutions to each of our countries, know exactly what they are. That's why in the alliance, finance ministers are in. Because what the finance minister will do in, in Togo might be different from what needs to be done in Morocco. You know, so each of them will do things that are very peculiar to each of those regions. So I think that's where I'll stop now. Okay, yeah. that's great. Do we want to come back on this question of some of the interesting new financial uh, tools out there, the green bonds, blue bonds, experiences that you're seeing? Um, do you anticipate more take up with those types of instruments uh, going forward? What, what has been your own direct experience on, um, on some of those? And maybe I'll start with you, uh, Neza. Okay, well, you, one has to understand that in our emerging markets, we have to face two, two challenges at the same time. First, the first challenge is to explain and convince that capital markets are there to finance projects and investments, not only the banking industry. You know, we are banking-based uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, f f financing system. And uh, up to now, capital markets uh, uh, maybe uh, contribute to less than 10% of the, uh, to finance less than 10% of the investment. So this is the first challenge. Whenever there's a project, it goes to banks. To, to be financed. And the second one is to explain what is a green, what is, a, uh, how to do to issue a green bond. So on, and uh, I, I think it is becoming su successful. We had, uh, we had very interesting uh, uh, green bond issues. The first one was, uh, was uh, issued by the uh, Morocco Sustainable Agency. Uh, I mean, uh, they wanted to issue bond. I said, well, you, you all green. So they say, oh, it's okay. So how do we do? So this is, uh, so they, they, they were helped by our guidelines and, uh, and it was a great uh, success followed by, by banks. It takes more time for banks because if they have to issue green bonds in order to either finance or refinance uh, 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 green uh, or climate related uh, uh, projects. So there's a follow-up. There's more. So it's. Uh, I think uh, uh, it is becoming. It just take more time first to to explain mm -hmm. what capital markets are for and to and also to raise awareness uh, and and explain what is what are these new instruments. What is required? What are the new risks? Uh, whereas we uh, institu investors, and especially institutional investors locally, are uh, are, are really uh, asking for more for more uh, of these uh, new uh, instruments. So uh, just take time to 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 explain, uh, and uh, until the decision is made by a company to issue a, a green bond, and not only a normal. Timothy, did you have any comment on? Well, uh, just to say, after 10 odd years of having that conversation, we've not gotten very far. Mm -hmm. Very disappointing. There are several objective reasons. I mean, in our region, uh, certainly money and capital markets are shallow. I mean, in the US, I don't know what the number is in Canada, but in the US, one in two citizens are invested in the US stock mm -hmm. market. And there's, people get wealth from investing in the market. In my region, it's one in 20. A lot of people are not exposed. And we are now on a mission to try to help them to understand that this is a potential source of wealth creation. So it's as basic as that. Then you have the issue where 
many of our countries do not have investment grade ratings. So in terms of a, a private sector coming in, so I agree with the professor, the private sector needs to get involved. I agree with you. But getting the private sector involved in that perceived high-risk environment is a challenge. So we're doing a number of things now in terms of obviously improving fiscal resilience, but also looking at the legal and regulatory frameworks. But one example of where I think we are making progress is with geothermal development. Remember I told you only about 8% of our electricity right now comes from renewables in the Eastern Caribbean. What is happening now is that using support from some of our development partners, grant resources, we are proving the, the, the resource, the geothermal resource. So in a couple of our countries, we've acted like Dominica, for example, gone in and proved the resource. That then opens up the possibility for the private sector to come in because you have the risk of the project. You know that the resource exists, and you can go in and you can raise financing. Hitherto, they either were not coming at all, or the very brave ones were, sign, were, were, were put in very skewed arrangements where all of the risks, because they felt they were taking all of the risks, all of the benefits were going to the investor. And uh, in many cases, they were not even raising the money. So you were stuck with a, an agreement and a very one-sided agreement. Mm -hmm. Now, by the risking the, 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 the resource, by proving that it exists, the government can then enter into a more equitable um, arrangement um, with the private sector. So I'm hopeful that in the next couple of years, we will actually begin to see that, uh, starting with, for example, Dominica, because I think they're the furthest advance in that area. Anything to add to, to these comments? Well, I think it's... Um... The governor has mentioned the issue of risk. We've tried to deal with this issue of risk for a while. For instance, we know that uh, solar energy is being, you know, produced at about one US cents per kilowatt hour in certain regions. But when it comes to Africa, everyone puts a very high risk, very high premium on it, mm -hmm. and it becomes very expensive. So for us at the African Development Bank, we believe that certain things happen, that uh, fiscal capital goes to where social capital exists. Do we have the right infrastructure to attract people to come in? Do we have the right policies? You know, private sector does not just come in, like you've said, it's very timid. Private capital is very timid. It comes out where there's stability and so on. So we have put in quite a lot in the risking instruments, guarantees, and so on, just to make sure that the private sector comes in, whether it's partial credit, partial risk guarantees, and so on, to attract the private sector. Because we believe this is the space for the private mm -hmm. sector. We want to increasingly use public money that we have to create this enabling environment, like the governor said, to bring in the private sector into this space. So we have created several instruments, several instruments to do this. The other thing that we think is also important, let me note here, is that most people don't understand some of these emerging technologies. And because of that, they put very high premiums on them. And most African countries really can't negotiate these contracts, this agreement. Mm -hmm. So we've established what we call the Africa Legal Support Facility crack team lawyers. If we don't have, we recruit and make them available for African countries to enable them negotiate these contracts, these deals with on these newer technologies that are coming up now. Thanks. Okay, we're gonna turn it back over and see if there's any questions from the from the floor. And I'll look over here because I'm kind of looking this way. But yes please. Hey, my name is Varun. I work for the Parliamentary Budget Office. Uh, first of all, Governor, I love that you mentioned uh, fiscal rules and fiscal discipline as a fiscal policy wonk. Uh, that made me really happy. Uh, I guess uh, two quick questions for you. Um, first was around, uh, you briefly mentioned disaster financing and hurricane clauses and stuff. Uh, what's your experience been like uh, building out the market and raising credit um, in the catastrophe bond market? And if you see any challenges in uh, approaching disaster financing and dis disaster recovery with the catastrophe bond market. And the second question is a bit more gentle and broad, and I guess this is something uh, Professor Nyang could answer too, but uh, around uh, trying to build a consensus and coordinating policy across you know, a divergent range of geographies, financial markets, and economies 
what's your general approach in doing that? Because I, I, I would think that's a significant challenge. Great question. Good. Well, it's good to have a policy, fiscal policy wonk in the house. <laughs> There's uh, two of you now. Well, <laughs> uh, but it's for a good cause. It's for development, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so our experience is very limited with CAD bonds. The, the experience is limited to what we did at CRIP. So full disclosure, I chair CRIP, SBC. And we did raise a CAD bond through the World Bank, Treasury Department, uh, a few years ago as part of our reinsurance cover. So typically, we, you know, we take a certain portion and we go up to reinsurance, and we decided to split reinsurance and CAD bond. Um, there is a market for it, uh, and, and, and we found it useful. But... I think at the broader level, our region is still trying to grapple with that possibility. As a first step, most of several of our countries, not most, several of our countries, Jamaica, for example, have now started, and you would know this from your time at the World Bank, disaster risk financing strategies, of which Cat Bond is, is one, to try to then position the country to be able to go out and tap into the capital markets. But you have to remember, in many of these, Jamaica is an exception, but in many of these countries, they have little or no access to the international capital markets, partly because they're small and they have no, no investment grade rating. So that is going to be a, a closed door unless we can sort of pool the arrangement, pool, come up with some kind of pool of it, using leverage in the World Bank uh, and the Treasury Department there. And that is something we are in discussions about. Good. And the broader question about, uh, you know, how, given the diversity of uh, countries and geographies at play in this space, where, where do you find common cause? How do we move this forward? Yeah, I think from the African perspective, we have regional monetary unions, and we try to coordinate things at that level. We also have um, situations where, for instance, we have Association of African Central Bank Governors. They meet regularly to coordinate this. We have the Association of African uh, uh, Stock Exchanges. They also meet regularly. We have Association of African Pension Funds. So we have regional groups within themselves that try to coordinate this. But I don't think it serves any practical purpose to have one policy for Africa. We've always said, Africa is diverse, extremely diverse. You have the almost those you call high income to those that are the least developed that you can imagine. And so it doesn't really make sense to put all of them together, but we have workable things around us through these associations that they understand what works and what doesn't work. Great. We have other questions? Yes. The question is uh, joining the first round of questions with this round. And to pose the question, if we take from what Governor Antoine mentioned about the graphs of debt and growth, global growth, slowing down, debt increasing. If we put the graph of emissions on that same picture, one would notice that emissions are still going up and way above where they should be. 2018 was a peak year, for example. So the, the graph of growth and emissions, we were hoping by greening finance and using clean technologies and the whole range of innovations we are talking about, that we will decouple growth and emissions. That is to say we might continue to have growth with much less emissions. Well, the evidence to date suggests that that's not happening. You know, evidence coming out of this book, More From Less, just written in the U.S., looking at the U.S. economy, suggests that that's not happening because if you take in what they import, if you take the national data, it seems to be decoupling. If you take the overall economy, it's not. Many people have now concluded that, in fact, we are not on a trajectory that will save us on time with climate change, that the worst effects are going to still hit us if we continue to solve our problems through economic growth, because we are not going to be able to decouple. I think that's where the evidence is now. So a bunch of uh, 
researchers are now coming to the conclusion and advocating that we have to find an alternative way of organizing our economies in which we continue to meet human needs, human development, and prosperity without growth being the fundamental objective of our economic organization. Now, that is completely contrary to what everybody in this room, I suspect, was trained in, in Economics 100 or Economics 500. The, the, you know, you now have a, a major book, which sort of uh, didn't get much attention in 2009, but now receiving a lot of attention, called Prosperity Without Growth. A leading economist out of the UK has put that out. The whole movement is growing on degrowth. So the question to the panel, I recognize that this is, uh, you know, this needs more research, it needs government action and a whole range of actors, but we all are involved in this. Is this, um, is this on your minds? Are we still hoping that we will get there on time by doing more of what we are doing now? Or are we really in a panic because the islands will go under by 2100? I mean, that's really serious stuff. Okay. And we are not doing the right stuff. Okay, so that is a very large question. Who would like to go first? Uh, Professor? Uh, yes. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm glad you mentioned, uh, Time. you know, a particular country. I don't think we need to generalize for everyone. Um, some years ago, when green growth wasn't still very popular, the African Development Bank came up with a strategy, 10-year strategy hinged on transitioning Africa to green growth. Among MDBs, it was not yet a popular issue because we felt we are a low-emitting continent. We want to remain low. We want to decouple our growth from high emissions intensity. And I think that's where we're heading to. So every of our strategy is geared towards that. But we know we're just a minor player. People have come to me and said, look, we need African countries to up their emissions ambitions, and I'm asking to what? Seychelles has contributed 0%, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.0, if you take it to two decimal points. So for us, ambition is what the African continent has set. Others should match that ambition that the entire region emits 3 4%. Then we would go into that decoupling. So what I'm trying to say, in essence, is that yes, certain regions like the governor said, that they want to be the uh, least the climate resilient region. Yeah, in the in, you know, a, a region. So these things are happening out there. Uh, a couple of years, two years ago, actually, when you read most of the economists, most of the journals that tell you Africa rising, Africa had eight of the 10 fastest growing economies and so on. But then when you talk to climate specialists, they tell you, Africa is very highly impacted and so on. So who wasn't telling the truth? So I put together the best of teams across the world, modelers on Africa's GDP, modelers on climate change, come together, give me a model that takes care of these externalities. And what we found wasn't pleasant at all, even for those high rising countries. Those countries that we're saying are rising very fast, they were not growing, whatever. When you factored in, climate change, and all this stuff. So that's what is driving our policies in making sure that Africa remains low. We're not going to decarbonize because decarbonization tells us you've carbonized and then you're trying to decarbonize. We will not get there. Thanks. Well, I'll just say very briefly that, I mean, we've always in our region understood that economics cannot truly explain quality of life. Uh, it's an international metric that's used for comparability, and you know it is what it is. It has its limitations. I will see that as an economist and accept that. In the Caribbean, we've always looked at things like our pristine environment, the fact that we have clean air. We value that. Social capital, family ties, the connections that we have, those, those things are important for us uh, and will remain important. Um, so we're going to push, continue to push with, in terms of some of those green uh, renewables because we believe that's important for what we're going to do, not just for the environment, but lowering the cost of business and doing business in our region. So we have compelling reasons to continue that path. But certainly, um, I am one, I'm, I'm very interested in other, other definitions that, because to be honest with you, part of the, the biggest frustration we have in our region 
is the over-reliance on per capita income. Because when you use that metrics, many of our countries are deemed to be middle income or high income, which means they've graduated from grants and concessional resources, and I make the point all the time. The hurricane in the US, Hurricane Katrina, 1% of US GDP. Hurricane in Grenada, 204%. Dominica, 226%. Instead of mashing up a little part of a, of a big country, the whole country gets destroyed. So that metric is absurd. And to use it as a basis to determine financing is, to be honest with you, most is unacceptable. So I, I welcome that shift. But in the meantime, we are going to continue to do some of the things that we're working on. Ms. Hayat, did you want to comment on the, the prospects for this path of reconciling economic growth and green growth? No, not really, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I'm not convinced the, 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 the link is, is always there, but, but we, we, we have to go on the, uh, we, we have to face the risk of climate change, mm -hmm. whether it will serve the growth of the economy. Well, this is a question I don't have the answer. No, that's... <laughs> um, Okay, well, we're almost near uh, the end of our time. I just wanted to put one more um, issue to, to each of you, and it has a little bit to do with the Toronto Center and the fact that it's International Development Week and, um, and that it's 2020, and at the end of uh, this calendar year, um, there will be a Conference of the Parties 26. You referred to the uh, Marrakesh uh, COP, but there'll be COP 26. In the United Kingdom has... Uh, put a focus on the issues around sustainable um, finance. Um, I'm wondering what you think would be a helpful outcome from a conversation. And I, uh, you know, because the earlier question about the international engagement, and we've talked a lot about local and, and what's happening on the ground in, in particular places in the world, Africa and the Caribbean and North Africa. But how do you see um, the sustainable finance uh, issue um, and hopefully, obviously, the engagement of the business community and financial regulators is, is pretty central to that. But do you see some a roadmap going forward that can help sort of spur on the kinds of conversations that we're having today, um, things that you could point to in the future, some have pointed to the disclosure, uh, other types of initiatives that have been put out. Um, I'm just curious how you see this, uh, this area of work uh, evolving into the future. Uh, a couple of you have also mentioned the, uh, the relatively urgent need to, uh, to do some further capacity building so that our regulators and financial supervisors understand the role that climate's playing in in financial markets, um, but maybe as a closing comment, uh, put that question, but anything else you'd like to sort of uh, make as a closing comment before we wrap up this evening? Governor Antoine? Well, I'd just like to say that I, I think um, there's a lot of work for us to do in terms of building capacity to, to green the financial system and to really incorporate climate risk into risk management frameworks. And as a regulator now, uh, we are keen to make sure that, first of all, we ourselves uh, build the capacity, and that's why the partnership with Toronto Centre is so important for us. Um, so what we did last year um, really gave us a, a good jump start uh, into that area, and that allows us to build not just our internal capacity, but to then pass on to our licensees and our countries mm -hmm. that kind of capacity. Um, we're going to need technical assistance to do national risk assessments in this area, climate risk assessments. Um, so countries are doing it, but then Licensees, financial institutions also need to do the same uh, to, to better understand. And then we, we, we have to, to, to really set some targets around that. So certainly what NGFS is doing, TF, in terms of disclosures, we believe more and more of that is required. And um, so I look forward to continue to work with the Toronto Centre. And that, that work is very important at this time, um, not just in the Caribbean, but I suspect around the world in developing countries. On the issue of sustainable financing, um, it would be great if we could find a way to begin this year to deliver on the Paris, uh, the Paris Treaty, the Paris Accord, the Paris Agreement. That is $100 billion every year for climate finance from 2020. And new money, please. <laughs> Not just repackaging and recycling. I know we believe in recycling, but when it comes to climate finance, <laughs> we need new money. I'm serious. So 
that would be, I hope, a big focus for the upcoming COP because we have to hold people accountable. You can just be rising emissions and you're not delivering on financing. So even those who are willing and want to proceed and not do not have the way with all, and those who can, I mean, it's, it's, it's disappointing to see in some parts of Europe, for example, that they're still investing in coal and still expanding coal. I mean, what is going on? That is the kind of... Now, if I sound anxious, it's because this is an existential threat to the region. So I cannot be a passive bystander in this, in this, in this enterprise. Mm -hmm. This is very, very important for us. But it's not just us, the region, or planet. So that is where, Christine, I'd like to see some focused attention and some results. And I'll leave it at that. Okay, that's perfect. So, Ms. Hyatt, there's your question, is where, where do you see us going? And uh, some closing thoughts on, uh, on greening finance. And where we go, uh, as the uh, governor said, we still need to, to do more, more work on capacity building and rising awareness, uh, getting a, a more uh, consensus about uh, all the, the aspects of uh, green capital markets, not only in our continent, but uh, this is what we're discussing on, on the level of IOSCO among all capital markets regulators. And we need a better standardization of, uh, of all, the, uh, 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 all the definitions. And we need to, to have the, the same understanding of what is sustainable, what is green, on the procedures, because as also Governor said, we we, we still expect to get uh, through uh, partly couple of markets these the uh, uh, these investments uh, to finance our projects in the continent. Final word to you, Professor Nyong. How are you, how do you uh, leave us today in terms of your uh, your points and thoughts for uh, the road ahead on uh, on greening finance? Well, let me start by commending the Toronto Centre because it's, a, it's, it's an institution that we need now, considering what's happening. We slept and woke up one morning and we heard of Lehman Brothers. Many of us didn't know who they were until the economy collapsed. And I don't think we need to wait to that point. We are seeing the signals. We're heading there. We need to measure and assess and disclose this risk so that we can deal with them earlier as we move on. In terms of uh, sustainable financing, we need to have clear policies, standards, what do we need? Impact investors, I'm glad that this group of people, they're coming up now, we're seeing an increase. I think $502 billion thus far in impact investment, but that's not enough. We need to make resources available to them. And that's why I like the slogan by the British, finance, greening finance and financing green. We need to be able to create opportunities. The people that will invest in climate change will be impact investors who are not just interested in profit, but want to see environmental and social impacts left behind. But the way we our banks are structured makes it very difficult. My country, Nigeria, interest rate is 30%. There's no way an impact investor will go to a commercial bank and take money at 30% to invest. What can we do? How can we create awareness for things like differential loan pricing? What sort of instruments can we create? We're looking at fintech companies. How can we bring them, expand their scope more so that they can enable us to reach people that ought to be reached in financing. So the conversation is very important. Right now, some countries have moved on, some countries are flying, but some countries are still left behind. This is a global agenda that we need to carry everyone along. If not, those behind will drag everybody behind. Thanks. Super. Well, I think you've you've earned your dinner so thank you all uh very very much i i think uh you know the perspectives of the caribbean africa north africa uh, perspectives from an mdb from a business person in directly in the financial sector and from our friend the central banker um i think it was a pretty wide ranging conversation and i want to thank them all very much for uh 
taking the time to come to Ottawa this week and uh, and share their perspectives and uh, and I do hope that uh, through the work of the Toronto Center, which is uh, I think it's nice to hear the recognition and acknowledgement of the special place that the Toronto Center occupies in in trying to uh, support um, countries' work in this in this space. It's a fabulous Canadian asset that uh, that we need to uh, make sure more and more people in the world are aware of. So I want to thank uh, the Toronto Center also for uh, creating the space uh, to make this a part of the conversation this week. So thank you all very much. Thank you.